Hey everyone, welcome back to another YouTube video. We're so happy to have you. I'm Rachel. And I'm Jessica. We are the Certified Occupational Therapy Assistants with Harkla, and today we're gonna give you five strategies for oral seekers. I have a lot of sand. I know you do. <laughs> Do you have an oral seeker? Do you know what that is? Are you not sure? Maybe you're just testing the water. Maybe this video just popped up and you're like, well, this is interesting. What the heck is an oral seeker? We are here today to explain all of that to you as well as give you strategies if you find out, yes, I do have an oral seeker. We're gonna help you out as well. Now we do have another YouTube video where we give you our 10 favorite oral motor activities. We'll link that below because there is gonna be a little bit of overlap in that video with today's video. But today we're gonna focus specifically on children who seek out oral motor input to the point where it affects their ability to get through their day. That's, that's the thing that we have to keep in mind. When does it become an issue if your child is an oral seeker? We know that Jessica's son, Logan, is an oral seeker, but it doesn't significantly impact his ability to get through his schoolwork or pay attention in class. It's just something that he prefers. So Jessica provides that input as needed as he requests. He's able to request it throughout the day and it's helpful for him. I will say we have bubble gum and strong flavored gum in our house all the time. Mm -hmm. I buy a new pack every time I go to the grocery store, so we're well stocked because that's his go-to. So for him, it's more of a sensory quirk because like Rachel said, it doesn't impact his ability to do the things he needs to do during his day. But if it did, then we would have to kind of dig a little bit deeper, find the underlying reason, and use more specific strategies for his oral seeking. So. It's a good idea to kind of identify if your child has oral seeking sensory quirks or if it's an actual oral seeking challenge that's impacting them significantly. So the first thing that you're gonna notice if it is very impactful is they're putting everything in their mouth and they're chewing on their hair, their pencils, they're coming home from school and their shirt collars are just chewed to pieces, their sleeves, their blankets, everything is being chewed on because they're trying to satisfy that need. They need more oral motor input than the typical person does in order to feel regulated and to feel like we normally would be just sitting here. Side note, it is a typical developmental milestone for infants to put things in their mouth. It's how they explore the world. It's how they understand objects and toys as they're growing and developing. But by about 18 months, we want to see that kind of taper off and they shouldn't be putting things in their mouth as frequently or as much anymore. If you're noticing them putting non-edible food items like clay or dirt or you know, odd things. We do want to look at something called pica, make sure we're ruling that out um, from a medical standpoint as well. So if it's consistent like pencils and hair and more of that like resistive input, we definitely want to be cautious of, you know, making sure we're not missing something. So bring that up to your pediatrician just to make sure we're safe. And then another thing you might notice is that they're overstuffing when they're eating. So they're putting mm -hmm. too much food in their mouth at one time. This can be a safety concern because it could potentially cause choking, so just be aware of that. But it can be a sign of oral seeking as well. So if you've decided you have an oral seeker, or maybe you have a kiddo like Logan who just has some seeking, some quirks, you still wanna provide some input, so here's what you're gonna do. First things first, work the body. Provide full body heavy work, things like animal walks, chair push-ups, pushing a laundry bin across the room that's full of toys, pulling that laundry basket back. Any way that you can provide compression or stretching to the joints, muscles, and tendons, that is going to provide that heavy work, that proprioceptive input that oftentimes they're seeking orally. Another one that we love is called the turtle crawl, and this is where your child will be on their hands and their knees to crawl across the floor, and you're gonna place a weighted blanket or the weighted lap pad on their back, and they have to crawl slowly enough to balance that weighted item without letting it fall off. This is a great heavy work activity. It's also really great for body awareness, so you kind of get, you know, you're hitting two birds with one stone in this case. 
If you know that you're going to be out in a situation where your child might be seeking this oral input, try to provide them with this heavy work before you go out, as well as have some oral motor tools that we'll discuss later on. Have those in your pocket as well to provide if the child is seeking that input. And maybe they're feeling nervous or anxious, making sure to provide that proprioceptive input is really grounding and organizing to the nervous system. It'd be really great if you could incorporate these heavy work activities into the child's daily routine. So into their daily sensory diet in the morning, in the afternoon, and in the evening. So they're getting that full body, heavy work, proprioceptive input throughout the day to help with that seeking behavior. The second strategy that you can incorporate are oral motor sucking and blowing games. One of our favorites is Bubble Mountain. All you need is a bowl, you're gonna fill it with water, put some squirts of dish soap in and grab a straw and start blowing and you're gonna watch this big bubble mountain appear. This is a great heavy work activity to the oral structures and our oral seekers love it. Another fun activity is to make a path with painter's tape on the floor, make shapes, make a road, grab a straw and a cotton ball if you can handle that texture <laughs> and have your child blow the cotton ball along the path. Um, or along the shape, but the trick with this one is to have them control their breath so they're not just blowing it across the room. They have to blow with the appropriate amount of force to keep the cotton ball on the path where it needs to be. They also have to control their saliva, and for a lot of our oral seekers, a lot of times you'll just see saliva everywhere with these blowing activities, so it's a great Sorry. activity. <laughs> I know. So it's a great activity to really bring awareness to that and have them really focus on controlling that. Mm -hmm. The next one, which is similar, is kind of like a minute to win it type game. You're going to, I always think of that for some reason. I think of it as a minute to win a game. I don't know why. Maybe you can come up with something better than that. But grab something like cereal pieces or some M&Ms and have the child use a straw and breathe in through the straw, holding the items to transfer to a different container. So maybe you incorporate more gross motor activities. They have to pick up the item by sucking it and holding it with their breath and then crawl across the room and then put it, blow it out where it needs to be like in another container. So you get more of that heavy work or you can just sit at the table and transfer from one bowl to the other. But it's very silly, it's very fun, but it also is very resistive, providing a lot of that deep pressure proprioception. Yeah, and that's the trick with these blowing and sucking games is their child is getting so much heavy work to their jaw, their lips, their cheek, their tongue, that it gives them so much great input and feedback that later on they're not going to be as likely to put non-edibles in their mouth because they've already received all that sensory input to meet their needs. Now, if you're feeling overwhelmed by like creating a sensory diet with all of these activities, rest assured, our goal here is to help inspire you to put your sensory goggles on and to just include these into your new sensory lifestyle, which we know it's going to happen after you've been watching us and hanging out with us for a while. You're gonna learn that you don't necessarily need that specific sensory diet for most kiddos, but just incorporating these sensory strategies into your lifestyle will make such a big difference. The third strategy is to bring awareness to these oral seeking behaviors. So teach your child that what they're doing is for a reason. You wanna approach this without any negativity, without any shame, just bring attention to it and say, hey, did you notice that you were chewing on your pencil while you were doing your writing task? Talk about why, talk about that their body wants that input more, and then talk about what's expected and unexpected. So it's unexpected to chew apart your pencil in class. It's expected to use your chewing necklace during class instead of chewing on your pencil. So teaching what's expected versus unexpected, teaching those strategies, but also teaching your child why they're doing it so they can better understand their body. The next strategy is to provide more sensory input during meals, and we like to call these sensory snacks. So things like sour candy spray, or salty foods, or spicy foods, or very chewy, resistive foods. Changing the types of foods that you're offering to provide more sensory input is definitely a more like typical approach to giving them more input. It's not a chewy that looks different from their peers, it's just snacks, everyone eats. So if we can provide more sensory friendly, I don't wanna say sensory friendly, but like sensory thought out snacks, 
that can provide the child with maybe enough input to help fight the urge to put their pencil in their mouth or to chew on their shirts. But when kids are eating just like macaroni and cheese or chicken nuggets, kind of like the same soft, you know, mushy foods, they're not getting enough input. So that could be one reason why they are seeking all of this oral motor input because their foods aren't getting, they're not getting it from their foods. They're not chewing on celery or carrots or a lot of those natural foods do provide more resistive input and sometimes that's just not doable. So something to keep in mind and something to try. Something to try. Yeah. All right, the last strategy is to use vibration. Vibration is a great way to provide a combination of tactile and proprioceptive input, which our oral seekers are seeking out tactile and proprioceptive input. So you can use full body vibration with those home medics vibrating massagers. That's a great option. If you're gonna use those on the face, make sure you let the child control that because that is very intense input if you use those handheld massagers on the face, it's very intense. So mm -hmm. let them do that if they feel comfortable, if they like it. But also looking into vibrating oral motor tools. Arc Therapeutic makes the Z-Vibe, which is a great option. And we don't necessarily want our kiddos to just be carrying around the Z-Vibe throughout their day. We wanna use it more purposefully. So using the Z-Vibe before they're gonna go into a situation where they're gonna seek oral motor input or using it before meal time so that their mouth muscles are activated and awake before they eat. And the great thing is, is that Arc Therapeutic does have some great blog posts and videos on ways to use the Z-Vibe in more purposeful ways. So if that's an option that you wanna look at the Z-Vibe, definitely check out their other resources on how to use it. One easy to implement oral motor vibrating strategy is to use a vibrating toothbrush. They have a variety of them that you can purchase, some super inexpensive and some more high tech, high quality, but it doesn't really matter whatever you choose. It's an easy way to implement more oral motor input, more of that vibration. And it's something that we like to call typical, right? Everyone brushes their teeth. So why not add in more opportunities for that oral motor input? Ultimately, if your child is seeking out oral motor input and it's affecting their day, what we wanna do is we wanna meet their needs, we wanna meet their sensory threshold, give them the input they're seeking in an expected, functional, purposeful way so that they can then carry on throughout their day. The last thing that we wanna do is, you know, avoid shaming them, avoid telling them that they're acting like a baby, avoid taking away that input without replacing it. I will say, my son, he's two. He was chewing on crayons the other day. And I said, well, that's unexpected. Here's a whistle that you can blow instead. You know, it took a few tries of him kind of being silly and goofy and two, but now he has been playing with that airplane whistle for, a couple of days now and when he feels like he needs that input he blows on it it's a very resistive whistle from talk tools so it's very beneficial for him and it gives him the input that he needs but just know that it does take consistency in order to replace and in order to make these changes put those sensory goggles on view life as a, it's a sensory experience because we all have sensory systems and it's gonna be okay if you liked this video, if it was helpful, let us know. Like this video, leave a comment. Make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. We put a new video out every Tuesday. Mm -hmm. Hang out with us on Instagram. You can find us at All Things Sensory Podcast as well as Harkla underscore family. We love hanging out there with you. You can send us questions. You can also comment below with any questions or things that you want to learn more about. We're here to help you and thanks for hanging out with us today. If you're no, oh, I was going to say something and I forgot about it. Hold on, give me a second. You made me, th I was just repeating it in my head trying to not forget it.